John, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. A lot of your viewers are from rural parts of, of Saskatchewan, but lots of farming communities represented. We had a tough time getting farmers to appear on camera. I mean, what are you hearing on your airwaves when it comes to the verdict of this trial? I'd understand that the reluctance of some farmers, this has been a really difficult situation for, for all of Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. I think farmers acknowledge there was a terrible loss. A young man lost his life. Mm -hmm. But beyond the criminal trial, there's been a lot of, uh, I think, healthy discussion about how do we conduct trials, uh, the presumption of innocence, the burden of the proof on the Crown to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. These are important issues, but deeper than that, in many, many regions of Saskatchewan, there are farmers who feel besieged, uh, mm -hmm. and there's been a big national or a big regional debate on RCMP access. Mm -hmm. um, you can have literally a life and death situation on a farm and an RCMP cruiser going 140 kilometers an hour will take 30 to 50 minutes to be there. Right, just the ge even the geographical challenges even the, of just this the province. geographic is challenges. This mm -hmm. is a vast province. Mm -hmm. So farmers in some areas uh, have been preyed upon. Um, they've had buildings torched, they've had vehicles stolen, they've had gasoline stolen and it's not always an indigenous issue, mm -hmm. but sometimes close to some indigenous communities, relations have broken down. So do you think then that farmers have been misrepresented in mainstream media as, as the villains here? Oh, absolutely they have. In fact, it was interesting, even in the Stanley case, it came out in the very early evidence, Stanley had, had a bunch of tires in one of his shops that he would often uh, give or sell to people who came by with flat tires. Mm -hmm. Because if you're far enough in rural Saskatchewan, Everybody knows the person who walks up to your yard and says, hey, I've got a problem. In this situation, it was far more complex than that. And, and the evidence itself showed it was far darker than that. There was a loaded firearm in the vehicle. Another farm, uh, there'd been an attempted theft. There were so many things going on at the time of this uh, SUV arriving in the Stanley yard that when Mr. Stanley testified, he felt, in his words, pure terror an awful lot of farmers knew precisely what that meant. Now, did it justify the death of a young man? Of course it didn't. Mm -hmm. But that's the context I think a lot of farmers see this kind of story in, in, you know, through that frame. Certain farmers have told me, you know, this is not a racism issue, this is a rural crime issue, period. But does race actually play a factor here? I mean, is there a race problem in that Battleford area? I don't think anyone took the time to make it a racial crime. So that's where I, I would deal with this issue. You don't think, John, that if that car was full of four white kids, five white kids, that it would be different? At, in the context as the evidence came in, okay, mm -hmm. let's remember, let's say the four, let's say three of the white kids lied three times. Yeah. They lied to the cops, they lied at the prelim, they lied at the trial. Then as you get out, and I don't mean to belabor this, somebody wearing a hoodie is rummaging through a vehicle, somebody else wearing a hoodie walks to your shop. You turn around, Somebody else moves, your quad starts. Mm -hmm. Then the vehicle moves towards your son. All of this is happening in 90 seconds. I don't think anyone's saying, is the man under that hoodie who's running toward my shop indigenous or non-indigenous? Mm -hmm. So I respectfully push back on the evidence here mm -hmm. a little bit against the, you know, the, the Toronto narrative. Now, are there racial issues in rural Saskatchewan? You bet there are, yeah. and it's not a good thing. I mean, mm -hmm. you've got certain First Nations communities relationships with nearby farmers um, that have really broken down. And is some of it at the root racism? I don't doubt that and I think that's, that's a really, really uh, sad commentary on where we are today. So what's the answer then for the farmers that you're talking to? I mean, is it, is it arming every single farm if we're in this, uh, this scenario again? And it's going to happen again. Arming, when the, when the outcome is the, someone's death, I mean, that gets you into sort of a, uh, a mentality, a siege mentality. Mm -hmm. the, the answer is going to be more community-oriented policing, mm -hmm. more community-oriented outreach. I mean, have we had a genuine attempt, particularly when you are dealing with proximate First Nations communities, to get the Indigenous community and the local community talking, mm -hmm. engaged, knowing one another, playing hockey like we used to in the town I grew up in. You, you, know, you, you knew people very closely in certain adjoining communities. Mm -hmm. It's going to have to cut both ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, farmers can't lock themselves up with guns, mm -hmm. but nor can the First Nations community, with respect, say, well, when a young man drinks 30 shots of alcohol 
And again, the evidence was he began drinking at Colton Bushy's grandma's house mm -hmm. that morning. Who let him get in a vehicle with a loaded gun, having drunk 30 shots? I mean, there's something there where you've got to say, again, I'm not blaming that for the death, mm -hmm. but somebody in that community or in that family has to say, you know, maybe that's not the right way to do this. So I think what we've got to do is get people moving toward a dynamic center and looking out for one another. How is neighbors? from different communities, John, do we move forward in, in places like Saskatchewan, other rural parts of Canada? Because, you know, I think of myself as a journalist. I've walked onto many farms in Saskatchewan, not knowing anyone, going knocking on the door, trying to find a story, talk to farmers. I don't know if I feel comfortable doing that anymore. I've walked onto farms in that exact scenario, mm -hmm. and once you get past the dog, <laughs> and you, you let the people know that you're there because you're lost. Right. They would bend over backwards. But John, we're different colors. So well, us approaching that doorway is very different. Absolutely. But I think a lot of it is, and, and a, an Indigenous guy phoned up and said, when you walk onto someone's farm and you're able to walk past the distrust and say, hey, I've got a problem, can you help me? Sure. Then good things start happening. If you come ripping onto the farmyard in that kind of context, as the evidence showed in this case, somebody's going to be very afraid. And when people are w operating out of fear, they obviously aren't going to make the best choices. John, you think that the Gerald Stanley verdict, uh, this whole conversation is actually a backdrop to something that happened in the 90s that most people don't know about. In northwestern Saskatchewan, um, in that area, when you say the names Tedarenko and Kip, Mr. Tedarenko was a, a farmer all by himself. His friend um, Brian Kip was visiting him one night Two men came out of the farm with a gun. They, one of the men who was later convicted of manslaughter said, well, I was just along to steal gas. The man with the gun didn't want any witnesses and shot them execution style. When farmers live in that context in that area, uh, this doesn't again mean it's ever right to shoot anybody. This doesn't indict people of red pheasant. But you can see the sensitivity when this is all happening. A farmer remembers the killing of, of Jerry Tedarenko and Brian Kipp even though it was 20, nearly 25 years ago, that still causes a lot of fear in that area. John, thank you for your time today. My pleasure, thank you.